Hi there, today I want to talk about maintaining long-term scientific collaborations. Uh, by that I mean maintaining collaborations over many years, maybe a decade or even several decades. These long-term collaborations, and there have been studies on that, have been shown to be very important for productivity and for output of researchers. They are also great for your career. And they also are, at least what I think, make things really a lot of fun. I think they make science better and I think they're also good for science. Now one thing is to start such collaborations um, and maybe I'll make another video on that. But once these collaborations exist, how do they actually become long-term collaborations? And how do you keep them alive, especially when distance is involved over various countries, for example. I've been very fortunate to have several and have had several of these long-term collaborations throughout the years, spanning in some case much more than a decade. And here I want to share with you what I have learned. But I think it's important <laughs> the way you think about that. And, and I, I think about them in the following way. These are in some ways also links in a network diagram of collaborations. But I think it's much more productive to think of them in terms of scientific friendships. These are your scientific friends. You very likely also have other friends. Maybe friends that live in the same city or in the same neighborhood. But this is your scientific circle of friends. You probably tend to think of the people surrounding you as more immediately as your friends and not so much your scientific circle because they may be dispersed over all kinds of different countries. But I think in the bottom line is there's, there's no real difference between, between these friends and other friends. So, I mean, people are different, but I personally couldn't work, at least not in the long term, with people that I don't like and that I don't respect. And so for me, these kind of long-term collaborations are inevitably also about friendship. And friendships also contribute to your overall happiness in life. And so I think friendships in science also contribute to your overall happiness in your profession, in your scientific enterprise. And so I think also in this respect, these science friendships are no different from the friendships that you have in other aspects of your life. Now, friendships, of course, mean um, a couple of different things. One thing that is inevitably a part of friendship is that it's about a give and take. It's about reciprocity. Now, what does this mean here? This means that in some projects, like papers or uh, grant proposals or meetings or workshops or whatever you do, you will take the lead. And your friend or your friends, they will partake uh, among other people in this endeavor. But then the tables turn, you know, next time it's maybe their turn and then maybe you get invited and then you contribute. So whoever takes the lead will rotate over time. And I think this is very important because this is part of this give and take. So if you're only part of the ever of the receiving end, maybe this is not right and, and vice versa. So it's good if, this, if these roles sort of change over time. Well, it's also important that if you contribute to a project that you've been invited, it's important to really make a good effort, to make a solid contribution and to be reliable, just like you would be in another situation with another friend in another part of your life. What friendship also means is supporting each other. So this is not just in terms of papers and uh, projects, but it can also be in terms of introducing people, introducing them to uh, people in your, in your circle of scientists, or introducing them to students of yours, or introducing your students to them, for example. This can be important. It could be important in terms of supporting nominations for prizes or awards, um, memberships. It can be all kinds of things how you can uh, support each other's career through, throughout the years, basically. And again, this can be uh, reciprocal. This can go back and forth over time. Uh, friendship also means recognition when they are successful. So it means congratulating them. It means feeling happy for their successes. It means celebrating their wins. It means sending them a note when they have published a nice paper and things like that. And um, basically to be happy for them when they do well. 
for me as a single child, this was admittedly a little bit difficult in the beginning, but I think I've gotten much better with that over the years. And so I think that it is just an important part of friendship as well. There's of course also some special challenges to the science friends. And the most important is distance, just physical distance. You know, I mean, often, you know, as scientists, we are uh, asked or slash required <laughs> to change um, countries, institutions, sometimes continents, like for example, in my case. And so then your circle of friends that you've had in one place, it, it moves into the it moves into a great distance from your new place. And that is, of course, making everything much harder. It's like um, time difference. And uh, of course, you make new friends where you're moving to in your new environment. And so then these other friendships are getting harder and harder to maintain. I think this is no different from other circumstances. This is just a specific case in science that we often are moving around, in some cases, in um, rather extremely. Um, other cases, maybe less. But moving is um, usually part of the game in science, and so this is a particular challenge in this case. It's easier to keep in touch when people are on social media. I mean, um, that made it relatively easy for me, at least for a while, to stay in touch with people in the US, where I spent a long time in my life, like about 14 years. Uh, it's much harder when people are not on social media, because then it's not as, well, effortless basically to just like or send them a message or something then you have to sit down and uh, write them an email and you have to actively think about doing that so it makes everything a bit harder but you know nowadays it's actually quite easy you can send an email you can do a video chat so you can very easily see them in the last few years this has become commonly established before that it was not so commonplace and so now there is much better technology to keep track of people this way another point is that sometimes things end uh, when you've moved away and you're gone, like you know, for example, in my case, I've been now in Germany for 17 years at the time of recording this video. So this is a long time. So then some of those links that were actually quite important to you when you were in another place, they fade. But, you know, sometimes it just takes looking people up and sending them a message and asking them how they are and what they are currently doing. And then those connections can be, you know, rekindled and you can um, continue uh, with this connection and um, well I just did some of that this morning as a matter of fact and maybe you can do as well. Yeah the last point I want to make is these close-knit groups of friends even though often I think they're just like two people connecting rather than like a whole group of people connecting even though that can also happen. These close-knit groups are, are, are nice and they're important and they make um, life better. I think for everybody involved it increases quality of life in terms of the science part. Um, but there's also a danger that they become sort of these uh, closed cliques or groups. And that, of course, shouldn't happen to the point that, you know, you exclude other people and that you maybe make decisions to support people only when they're, they're part of your clique, basically. So that would be the sort of the, well, the dark side of this. Um, and that shouldn't happen. You should... Uh, still, you know, maintain a professional stance, for example, when it comes to proposing people for prizes or uh, suggesting them or writing letters of reference or whatever it is that we do, uh, you should still put merit higher than your friendship, of course. But I think everybody will understand that and that shouldn't stand in the way of friendship. Basically, don't sacrifice professionalism. Yeah, so good luck with <laughs> maintaining your network of friends and um, also with finding them in the first place. These connections are very meaningful. I think they make everything better. And so I think it is really worthwhile investing the time that it takes to keep them alive over the years. Also remember that such, such friendships in science, they don't need to necessarily just be with people directly in your field um, as you bump into people and make connections at um, conferences or meetings where you just happen to really like somebody. I think those can be also useful much later on, even though if it's not immediately apparent why you would want to connect with somebody in the humanities, for example. But it could become really fun, and especially um, when you connect with them on a personal level. 
yeah, to me, they're a huge source of joy in, in my professional life. So I think um, it is worth spending every minute on trying to maintain them. And you need to realize that it takes a little effort. Now, I'm probably not the best of friends. So if you listen to this video and you haven't heard from me in a while, sorry, just send me a message. And with that, thanks for watching. See you in the next video. Bye.